practicing. Oh, all right. And I am going to welcome you again. And you didn't hear the first one. So anyway, uh, let's uh, pray to God and ask his uh, blessing. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of another day. Help us to see it as such. We pray that once again, your Holy Spirit will use your word uh, for your glory and our growth. Uh, so, Lord, uh, may this lesson and this time together uh, be pleasing to you and ourselves. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, a big issue for all of us, but for Paul, certainly, was uh, what do I do with my life? And Romans chapter 1, verse 1, uh, identifies Paul as the servant of Christ Jesus. And so that was his uh, general calling. Uh, but then the specific calling follows right after that, called to be an apostle. And that was uh, a special kind of apostle. There were two sort of categories, unofficial categories of apostle. There were the 12 apostles, the original group, when Judas uh, defected by way of suicide from that elite group. Uh, there was a replacement, and so they maintained the number 12, probably representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, but uh, in any case, there was this group of 12. But then you may uh, remember that there were 70 apostles sent out by Jesus during uh, his public ministry. Uh, so uh, there were the sort of official 12, the basic apostles, and then there were these other general apostles. Paul considered himself uh, to be uh, on a par couldn't put it that way, with the 12 disciples. He never was considered one of the 12, but uh, he was something uh, more central, I suppose you could say. Maybe that's the wrong word, but uh, more uh, elevated in status. Uh, maybe that's the way to think of it. Uh, than the 70. So, he was right up there with the the twelve apostles. The uh, twelve are those who are mentioned in Acts uh, right after Pentecost, uh, where uh, it says uh, they devoted themselves to the apostle teaching. That's in. Acts 2, verse 42. Uh, and that refers to the 3,000 who uh, gave their lives to Christ on Pentecost. 3,000 men, it says in verse, uh, oh, let's see, that would be verse 41 of chapter 2. Uh, that these are the ones that devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The apostles there, meaning the twelve. In any case, Paul uh, is a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, and set apart for the gospel of God. Uh, he is uh, one who uh, is... Uh, to honor the name uh, of Christ, 
the gospel promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God uh, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So uh, this is the center of Paul's life, a servant of Jesus Christ. That means he was willing to uh, do whatever was asked of him. Uh, and we know from other uh, sources in the New Testament that his life was far from an easy one. Uh, there were all kinds of difficulties that he endured uh, with the help of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but verse 5 here in chapter 1 of Romans goes on to say, Through him. And for his name's sake, uh, we received grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles. So uh, there was uh, a wide application of his calling uh, to all the Gentiles, so all the nations. Gentiles was another name for uh, those who were non-Jews, not the Jewish nation, other nations. Uh, so people were to be uh, drawn out from all the Gentile nations to the obedience that comes from faith. And then Paul goes on in verse 6 to say, and you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. All right, so there's this sense uh, of uh, identity, but also ownership, uh, belonging to Jesus Christ, was uh, to say that Christ was the one who, in some sense, owned them. And so, uh, again, the word servant uh, can be understood in that sense of slavery almost. And you remember there were slaves in the Roman Empire. They were a large part of the population. So Paul is a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. And then he points out that the gospel uh, that he is uh, committed to and is proclaiming is something that had been anticipated in the Old Testament, in the Holy Scriptures, verse 2. And uh, this accords with the fact that uh, on the day of resurrection, when the two uh, disciples were walking to Emmaus uh, and were joined by this third person uh, who they learned after a while was the risen Christ. Uh, these people uh, were uh, also uh, those who recognized that uh, this Messiah, Jesus from Nazareth, uh, was anticipated in the Holy Scriptures. But Jesus reinforced this when he was with them. It says in Acts uh, that, or no, it's, uh, it's uh, John, uh, Luke's Gospel that we hear about uh, these two people. Um, let's see. Yes, uh, they were very downcast. Well, this is in uh, Luke chapter 24. And it begins the whole account in verse 13. Luke 
24, verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to the village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. That's quite a hike. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem? And do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers hand him, him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. So that was the anticipation. Now, as it happened, uh, God saw fit not to give any prophet uh, to the people for 400 years prior to uh, John the Baptist. Uh, but during that four a uh, hundred years, the people of Israel uh, had this belief and held on to it that uh, God was going to send a Messiah, uh, a, a son of man, uh, to use Daniel's terminology, that God was going to send his representative and his son, his only son, uh, to be their king of kings. So that was the anticipation. And so they say, uh, we had hoped that he, Jesus, was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what's more, it is the third day since all this took place. Verse 22, in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. All right, so that's their uh, tale of woe to this stranger who happened to be Jesus risen. Verse 25, he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? What prophet especially comes to mind in terms of speaking of the Messiah as the suffering servant? That would be Isaiah. Isaiah uh, chapter uh, fifty. 5, Isaiah 53, especially. All right, so um, they uh, were disappointed, and Jesus pointed out that they were slow to comprehend the Old Testament scriptures, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So the law, as represented by Moses here, uh, and all the prophets who were appointed by God in the Old Testament period to interpret uh, the uh, Torah, the laws of God, as found in the books of Moses, um, the law and the prophets, all of this pointed forward 
to the Messiah. So as they approached the village to which they were going, this is verse 28 now, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with him. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us when he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven, uh, so the twelve minus Judas. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it's true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. People have surmised that, well, when he broke the bread, his hands were exposed and they could see uh, the marks of the nails that had been uh, the means of fastening Jesus to the cross. All right, so... Uh, this is the uh, matter of Christ being the center of uh, the affections and the attention and the comings and goings of God's people, his apostles and those who came to believe on Pentecost uh, on that day. So, uh, Paul's goal in life, to call people from among the Gentiles, Peter said the same thing to Peter. Remember uh, when the uh, disciples, uh, Peter and James, John, Andrew especially, uh, the four of them, um, two sets of brothers, uh, when they were mending their nets and Jesus was teaching the crowds and uh, he was being pressed uh, to the water's edge uh, by the crowds. And Jesus uh, spotted one of the boats that was empty and uh, secured that, and asked if it would be all right if uh, the owner, in this case Peter, uh, would uh, take him out a little ways into the water so he could teach from the water, uh, which he did. And... Uh, then on that occasion, Jesus suggested to Peter that they uh, send out their uh, boats and uh, use the nets that they had been repairing and fish again. And Peter said, we've been fishing all night, Lord, didn't catch a thing. Uh, and yet uh, Jesus uh, encouraged them to do so, and they did. And then you remember that their nets uh, were filled full of fish uh, to the point of their almost breaking. Uh, and on that occasion, uh, Peter recognized that in Jesus there was something extraordinary uh, and said, uh, Lord, depart from me. Why? Uh, I'm a sinful man, he said. So he was aware of uh, in uh, the presence of this Jesus person uh, who obviously just enabled them to uh, secure the catch of a lifetime uh, in, in the presence of this person uh, Peter said I'm a sinful man and Jesus said uh, you uh, have caught fish, but I'm going to make you into a what fisher of men. So it was the same idea that these people would be sent out, uh, Peter and, and the others. And that's another meaning of the word apostle. Word apostle means sent out. 
the people who are sent out as messengers uh, to represent uh, higher authority. Jesus said to Peter, I will make you a fisher of men. I will send you out to be that. Okay, so uh, we have Paul, his goal in life, called to reach out with the gospel to the Gentiles, to the nations, other than Jews, in other words. Um, and uh, Romans 1.5 indicates that uh, they are to go out and teach people obedience that comes from faith. And Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, by their fruits you shall know them. Okay, what were Paul's intentions regarding people in Rome? Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 11, 12, and 13 Uh, Paul says, I long to see you, verse 11, so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I plan many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. So uh, Paul uh, here indicates that uh, he has wanted long to be with them to impart some spiritual gift. Now, in... 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul talks about uh, the gifts of the Spirit. And in fact, there are several places in the letters of Paul where he speaks about the uh, gifts of the Spirit. The, the lists are not identical. They're nearly identical, but they're not quite the same. But in any case, the gifts of the Spirit were those abilities that God, through the Holy Spirit, distributed uh, among the believers uh, for their mutual uh, encouragement and growth, that uh, this was how they were to uh, help one another recognize that the Holy Spirit really was among them. And some people uh, there among the Corinthians Corinthian believers uh, were uh, considering the gift of speaking in tongues as being a little bit superior to the other gifts, the gifts of administration, gifts of teaching. Uh, and so Paul deals with that in Corinthians. Uh, but uh, here in Romans, he just speaks in a general way, he wanted to impart to uh, the believers in Rome uh, some spiritual gift to make you strong. And then verse 12 goes on to say, that is that you and I may be mutually encouraged. So the giving of the gifts of the Spirit was to be an encouragement to the whole church, the whole collection of those who believed in that particular place. And there were other churches. We think of church uh, here uh, in the New Testament. When the word church is used, it uh, would seem to uh, be the broad number of believers who then in turn would gather uh, into different groups we know this from Romans uh, at the end of it. Let's turn to it. We'll just see uh, what he says. His words to uh, the various people in Rome. This is chapter 16 in Romans. 
he begins by saying, I commend to you, our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church in Shenkri. Uh, so this is one location of believers who gathered together. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and to give her any help she may need from you. For she has been a great help in, uh, to many people, including me. Um, verse 5, chapter 16, verse 5. Greet also the church that meets at their house. This is uh, Priscilla and Aquila. So here is uh, the group of believers meeting at the home of Priscilla and Aquila. And uh, they're identified as the church. Uh, in verse 3, Paul's uh, talking about Priscilla and Aquila. He says, they risked their lives for me. Verse 4, not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. So there is the church in general uh, that uh, often is what is meant. Uh, by Paul and writing to these different churches. But also, there are these smaller groups of Christians uh, who came together for worship and teaching and fellowship. All right, so verse 5, greet also the church that meets at their house. Um, and uh, I believe they're may be another uh, mention here, and I think it's verse 10. Yes, it's verse 10. Greet those who belong to the household of Aristobulus. So the church, gathered church, these smaller units that met in different people's homes, uh, these were called households also, as well as churches. So... In verse 10, greet those who belong to the household of Aristobulus. So, um, without laboring this any further, just to recognize, one has to look at the context in the scripture to uh, be able to ascertain whether the author is writing about the church in general or churches in particular. All right, um, so the intentions regarding the people uh, in Rome, Paul's intentions, to impart some spiritual gift. And then verse 12 of uh, chapter 1, Second Romans chapter 1, uh, verse 12, encouragement. Uh, he writes and uh, wants to be with them in order that uh, he and the people that he will be meeting with in Rome can be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. So uh, there had to be many occasions where this uh, believer or that would say, I, I want to tell you what happened to me the other day. And this, of course, is just exactly what happened with the two uh, Cleopas and his companion, as they uh, walked to Emmaus, and they broke bread, they had communion with the Lord, the risen Lord, and uh, he opened to them, uh, helped them to understand the scriptures that spoke of Christ. Uh, I'm sure they wanted to know, well, uh, where else does it say in the prophets that uh, you would have had to have suffered on the cross beside Isaiah. And so Jesus opened all of the scriptures, uh, Old Testament scriptures to them. And so they would uh, encourage those uh, who didn't have this experience, encourage them with this remarkable uh, encounter that they had with the risen Christ. So this is how they would encourage one another. And that's what Paul certainly envisioned here, uh, that uh, the believers would say, well, 
I was praying about this and, and the Lord answered it. He was there uh, and various other experiences. So mutual encouragement. And then uh, finally in verse 13, he indicates that he planned to come many times uh, to them, but were prevented until now. Uh, he wanted to come in order that I might have a harvest among you. So fruitfulness, growth in the Holy Spirit. These were some of the things that Paul uh, wanted for himself and wanted for the other believers. So um, how strongly did Paul hold these intentions? Very uh, is the short answer. Romans 1.11 I long to see you. And then Romans 1, 9. Um, God, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his son is my witness. How constantly I remember you in my prayers. So this is not a one-time thing. This is, is Paul day in and day out longing to be with the believers in Rome, praying for them constantly. And then verse 15, uh, he says, this is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. Uh, and he says, the reason is that I'm obligated. Uh, this is my calling. This is what God has sent me uh, into the world to do. This is why Christ came to me on the road to Damascus uh, and uh, turned me around in my thinking and my living. So uh, that was the great turning point for Paul. And uh, he could speak of himself and other believers as new creations. Uh, this is a strong word, reminiscent of the word used in uh, genesis of the creation of the world uh, and a very powerful word this is the same word that's translated here uh, that he indicates that he is uh, so eager to preach the gospel to them all right what is the theme of romans uh, we've pointed this out before just to review it's righteousness the theme of Romans is righteousness, uh, the righteousness of God, righteous in the presence of God. Uh, in developing this theme, uh, beginning in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, there is the unrighteousness, by contrast, of all mankind. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Paul wrote in uh, Romans chapter 3 and verse 10. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. That seems rather extreme, but what Paul is saying is that not that people don't do some good things or don't have moments when uh, they're pleasing to God, uh, but the overall confidence that the people of God, the Israelites had in being able to earn God's favor and his acceptance and his forgiveness, that goes out the window. That's finished. Paul says, no, that doesn't work. Uh, there's none who is going to be righteous uh, in God's sight on the basis of their good work, on the basis of uh, the ways in which they obey God. That's not going to do it because it, no one does it perfectly. So when Paul says there's no one righteous, not even one, no one who seeks God, all have turned away, they've become worthless there's no one who does good not even one he's saying on the basis of keeping god's commandments 
nobody's going to be able to save themselves. So the righteousness of all mankind is treated on. And then uh, God uh, prompted Paul over in chapter 3 uh, to write this, verse 21 of chapter 3. After having said that there's nobody who's righteous, nobody, not one, then he goes on to say, but, but now a righteousness from God, apart from law, that is, apart from keeping the law, has been made known, to which the law, that is, Moses, five books of Moses, and the prophets testify, this righteousness from God not a righteousness that's done by uh, those who are seeking to save themselves. This righteousness from God, verse 22, comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference, for all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God, and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus, by Christ Jesus. He goes on to say in verse 25, God presented him, put his son forward as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. We'll look at that word atonement in just a minute. He did this to demonstrate his justice. You would think you'd would be mercy here, but he's making a point. He's saying that God's mercy doesn't uh, go in the face of justice. It's a fulfillment of justice, his mercy, as Christ hung on the cross and died for the sins of others. And so Paul says people are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice, because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. All right, so there's a righteousness which is uh, just God's posture, his attitude, his uh, way of regarding the people who believe in Christ. It's not that they actually become righteous as God is righteous, uh, but God is treating them as if they were righteous. This is what is meant here, that uh, they are justified freely by his grace. God presented him as a sacrifice. He did it to demonstrate his justice. Um, he did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus, even though they're sinners. So God's righteousness is counted to those who believe in his son as righteousness. But then it goes beyond that. God's grace is not content to just um, indicate to people that in his mercy, he's not going to destroy them as their sins would deserve. Uh, not only that, but God wants people, believers, to actually grow in their belief. Uh, and so uh, sanctification is that which God imparts uh, to those who believe. Chapters 6 through 8 uh, is where we'll find that. And then God's righteousness is vindicated by that, uh, Paul is dealing with the uh, problem that uh, many 
Israelites, people of Israel had um, with the fact, and probably Gentiles as well, but especially the Israelites, uh, Israel was rejected. Uh, the gospel was taken to the Gentiles. Uh, the people of Israel rejected God, rejected his son when they told uh, Pilate that they wanted Pilate to crucify the Lord Jesus. Crucify him, crucify him, they kept saying. Uh, so, was God then uh, unfaithful to his word uh, in that he did not save Israel, but rather rejected them? And Paul answers that by saying, well, the rejection was only a temporary rejection uh, in order that the gospel might be brought to the Gentiles. But uh, in the end, God will... Uh, deal with the people of Israel, the nation of Israel again. And uh, this time uh, he will forgive them. And so uh, all those that God has chosen uh, from among the people of Israel will be saved. So that's chapters 9 through 11. And then in light of all these chapters, 11 chapters, uh, Paul goes on then to talk about practicing righteousness. And so he, he says uh, in chapter 12, verse 1, don't need to turn to it, I'll just read it. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. I'll read verse 2 also. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. All right, so that's right, righteousness practice. So go on, get on with it, Paul is saying to the Romans. In view of God's tremendous mercies that I've just been laying out before you. In view of that, uh, let your thinking be changed, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So you need to rethink what is real and then live on the basis of that. So in chapters 12 uh, through the end, Chapter 16, uh, there is God's righteousness, which is practiced. All right, so uh, the theme of Romans, righteousness, a right relationship with God. God is holy and will punish those who don't know him. Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8. Uh, he makes his son to be the one whose treatment determines the destiny of all. And then one thinks of the parable of the sheep and goats, uh, which is given to us uh, by our Lord, uh, recorded in Matthew, the last chapter of Matthew 28. Or no, I'm sorry, uh, Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes, this is Jesus teaching now, this parable. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. And then verse 32 of chapter 25 all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left 
Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you uh, since the creation of the world. God has had you believers in his mind and heart since before there was any creation. It's astounding to think of it. But uh, this is um, what is um, understood now in terms of the salvation, the belief in Christ that is evident. Uh, this is something uh, that has been prepared for you since the creation of the world. And then he makes, uh, Jesus makes uh, it clear what he means by how oh, you've taken care of me. For I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous believers in Jesus Christ, the sheep, will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Jesus still teaching this parable, the king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. And then he deals with those on the left uh, who uh, wonder why they are being rejected and because they did not care for Christ when he came to them in the form of some person uh, or people uh, that were in need and uh, they just uh, didn't bother to help them. Uh, they also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. All right, so um, God makes the destiny of any individual uh, based on what they did in terms of Jesus Christ. And what they did with Jesus Christ was determined by how they treated fellow human beings. So the whole matter of loving others uh, as a summary of the Old Testament laws, commandments, uh, this is uh, a matter of tremendous import that uh, on the basis of how we deal with other people uh, will uh, show what we think of Jesus Christ um, because we'll be seeking to uh, live our lives in a way that he would approve. Now, the nature of the punishment of the wicked, more quickly, we'll look at this. Therefore, God gave them over. What does this phrase mean? God gave them over. Uh, and um, we have uh, this statement in the NIV study Bible uh, about that phrase. God's judgment where takes... Beg your pardon? Where, where, where are you? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Romans chapter 1. Verse 24. Uh, and Paul is speaking about uh, mankind in general, uh, the wicked, those who suppress the truth. Verse 18. 
uh, by their wickedness. And he says in verse 24, therefore, um, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. And then verse 26, because of this, uh, this exchanging the truth of God for a lie, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones, uh, and so on. And then he says in verse 28, furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. So uh, the phrase gave them over is tantamount to saying God allowed the natural consequences of people's sins to run their course. And if you have an NIV study Bible, that's on page 1707. But the important thing is to recognize God, uh, having been patient with people for a long time, putting up with their wickedness, uh, not judging them and punishing them because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Uh, not at first, but then eventually he will. So God will punish the wicked eventually. They exchange the truth of God for a lie, um, and they uh, were given over then to judgment and to a depraved mind. All right, uh, I think we could stop fairly soon. What time do we have here? Yeah, it's a good stopping point. Next time we'll pick it up and uh, consider what Romans means by truth. Um, we've just read that the wicked exchange the truth of God for a lie. Well, what is meant by truth? There are different things that are meant. Uh, and we'll look at that. Okay. Um, closed. So I think we'll close now uh, with prayer. And uh, then after a short prayer, I'm going to ask uh, if there are any people that uh, you would like us to pray about or any matters of thanks. Uh, for past prayers answered. So let's uh, uh, close with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your speaking uh, clearly and powerfully through your servant Paul, and still speaking. Uh, so we believe that your Holy Spirit will have been using these words from your word uh, to help us to be more like your son. And uh, now will you direct us as we pray for one another, uh, asking all this in the name of your son. Amen.